of the women who are still alive would come. The ones that died is Vera Hecker that played the piano. Uh, she died last year. Fyokla Andreeva with the frogs in the mouth story uh, who died uh, just this year. Um, we wanted to call her to say that this is considered for an Oscar um, and we learned from the villagers that she died. And of course the old lady who walks away from us who was almost a hundred years old so she died almost after we interviewed her. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> do you have any? Um, yeah. Are you going to do this from the aerial shots? Oh, this is drones. Uh, this is drones and that was done uh, in, um, in collaboration with the Gulag Museum. There was no Gulag Museum when I started making this film or conceptualizing it in 2012. There were just two tiny rooms in Moscow and the actual museum opened three years ago. Um, and I draw parallels with uh, the fact that there is a huge museum of Holocaust both in Moscow and in Washington DC, but the Slavery Museum was only built a few years ago. So they built this big museum in Moscow and I thought too little too late, but they had this amazing you know, amazing expedition which we joined to go to the camp where actually Bosnik was working on the uranium mines and I gave them a little bit of the interview and I said well, when she's talking about holes in the, in the um, mountains, you know, do, the, do these holes and do this panorama, so they shot it to her interview. Uh, so that was, we were very lucky um, and that's for 4K versus everything else is HD and, you know, smaller camera. camera. Um, yeah. I see that you decided making this not to uh, add any focus for any of the women on when they ended their exile work in camp about that time, even though you talk about the death of Stalin. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about that? Why you, you made a decision not to show that transition or that period or that or talk to them about that? So Between the between the exile and between the time of their exile and their later and the later yeah. period the thing is it's practically a short film you know this is not an hour and a half movie you know which is it's not a feature which is 90 90 minutes 70 minutes so we had to choose you know what what would be most important and for us um you know i would i would have loved in a longer film to show more um, another interesting thing about structure, I tried to follow, I, I read Solzhenitsyn's book, which is a Bible, you know, for anybody who wants to know more about the history of this period, and uh, Levitska was his assistant, you know, which is interesting, so everybody knows in this world about Solzhenitsyn, nobody knows about the woman assistant um, who helped organize and collect all this material, she met, she met him at the later time, he didn't just have one assistant, but um, uh, I, when I read the book, Solzhenitsyn's book, I took some of the names of the chapters from his book to structure the film. So it would be a parents, arrest, interrogation, exile, uh, liberation. So I just, I structured it like that because out of many books that I read on the subject, um, this was, that impressed me the most. There is also a book by a woman, um, Eugenia Ginsburg, called The Whirlwind Road, which is um, one person's account uh, about this uh, this area, uh, this era. Oh, sorry. Um, so these are two books to read. <laughs> Somebody wants to know more. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck by the artwork that is featured mm -hmm. uh, in the documentary. Yes. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about whether there's more of that material where it is, and if anybody is working on it. Of course, um, there are several women in in you know famous for this, you know, and if I get there was a woman who was a, um, a nun who was arrested and she has a series of very, very famous pictures and they're widely available on the internet um, about this and they're completely brutal. To, to look at this is, is impossible. This is uh, Vera's sister. It's not actually the sister she's talking about. She had five sisters. This is Marcella's drawing, but for the sake, because it's a short film, practically, you know, she's talking about one sister, we're talking another sister's drawings. Three of them were arrested and set in prisons, and two of them, they didn't even, you know, they were, they were not in the house, they were, they were not in town. They were in Moscow, this was a suburb. So basically, the, the interesting thing was that they would arrest those that were available at the moment, and the next day they would move on to another assignment. 
So those two women were lucky they were not home, and these were not lucky, so three ended up in prison, two ended up... Um, it's just to say how brutal but also random this was. They just moved on and didn't look for the other two sisters, um, even though everybody was supposed to. So uh, this is available on the internet, uh, but I don't know if you can Google it in Russian. I should probably enhance my website and do a lot of you know those kind of background materials so that people in the world can find it. If you know Vera Hacker's Russian name, you can you know type in Marcella Hacker and. Uh, in the city where she said some local press, more images are, you know, are available. But um, uh, she was uh, a painter, and the pencil drawings are the ones that she made while in prison, and the color were made when she was already uh, liberated by memory. Another interesting thing about the drawings is that, as opposed to the Nazis, uh, who carefully documented everything that they did, every atrocity for posterity, who filmed everything. Who um, you know? Who kept those photo records? The KGB, you know, did not. They meticulously destroyed every record of what they of what they've done. Not only they destroyed, they didn't take films, except for some propaganda how they reform and form criminals. They also destroyed every evidence. They destroyed letters. They destroyed documents, and they destroyed the whole settlements that were created. Uh, for those prisoners, they would be they would be just in the 90s. They would pour kerosene on on these um, former settlements and burn everything to the ground. So there is really not much uh, remaining aside from these ruins, um, aside from one camp that we're showing briefly that was made in a museum uh, into a museum and uh, personal accounts like drawings. So this is why this is. A, you know, and I'm an archival researcher. I've done research for maybe a hundred Hollywood films, three of which received the Hollywood, uh, you know, received the Academy Awards, and one was nominated. So I'm probably one of the very good researchers in, in, in the industry, and I can I couldn't find much because there is really it's a desert. There's not much available. So those pictures are very important to you know in this um, history. There's just not much, just drawings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did how did the Russian like did you at any point feel that the Russian government was trying to stop you or something from making this documentary? No, um, uh, you know the times have really changed. You know, it was very easy to film in terms of you know I hired the local Russian crew. Documentary filmmaking is very is suffering in Russia. It's not a golden age of documentary filmmaking there because. Um, Russian, you know, television is completely controlled by the government, Channel 1 and 2. And uh, there is really not a good school of documentary filmmaking because of this whole propaganda machine that has been um, in place for a long time. It became much better in the 90s when, um, you know, all this came out and there was a lot of films and books uh, published in, in memoirs you know, in the 90s. But once Putin came to power, and which happened 10 years ago, and, you know, this slowly started coming back. Archives started closing down and, and um, uh, it's not forbidden, nothing is forbidden, it's ignored. So we were largely ignored. We were not helped, we were ignored. And what happened with the Academy shortlist, first Voice of America noticed us. They said, well, you know, Russians are PR in their film called Sobibor about uh, the Nazis and how the Red Army hero um, was leading the uprisal, the Jewish uprisal in the, in the Jewish ghetto and they didn't get any attention from, from the academy and so all Russian media were speaking three months ago about how academy did not notice their film and then Voice of America said wait a minute there's a Russian woman who did this um, and nobody is talking about it and then a couple of liberal small liberal media you know uh, rain, TV station rain there was uh, Radio Liberty, Radio Freedom, Echo of Moscow, small radio station, they all started talking about it. And, um, you know, which is, and then the Ministry of Culture, you know, wrote a, a, like a short letter saying, you know, we, we are aware of what's happening, but you know that you didn't register for a license to, to show it in Russia, so we just, we're just informing you of that, sincerely, you know, to the Ministry of Culture. Had the film gone further to nomination and to possibly winning, they would have had to react. 
But what happened also, they did react. You know, Moscow Film Festival invited the film, and then we got a call from the official, official Channel 2 in Russia saying, we would like to buy the film. Um, we can't offer much, you know, we'd like to show the famous version, not the longer one, but the famous one. I said, what do you mean by the famous? Well, the one that is listed. But um, we want to keep the right to censor it. You know, I said, what do you mean? <laughs> well, we want, you know, you know, it's a very standard procedure. Television, you know, if you buy it, you can, uh, um, you know, it's a routine procedure. You, you reserve the right to change it for television. And I said, well, what would you change? They said, well, we can't, we can't say now, but we suspect it might be a couple of shots at the end because where did you take the statistics from? You know, we need to, the statistics, we, you know, we don't know any, it was everywhere, it was in the BBC News, it was everywhere. You know, we need to know where statistics is and that illusion, you know, these doubles that are, you know, we don't think it's pertinent, you know, so why don't you, we'll tell you later. So this is a, we have negotiation pending and even if they cut out the end in it, be a fantastic victory for us, almost like getting an Oscar, to show it um, to a 30 million uh, people audience, you know, which is the audience of the Russian channel too. We would, we would love for as many people as possible to see the film in Russia, because this is our market now, um, and that's what, you know, that's what um, I would like to see happen. Moscow Film Festival is a big, uh, big festival, which is run by Mikhalkov, who did this Oscar winning film, Burned by the Sun which is, by the way, the only Oscar-awarded film on the subject of Gulag. Um, and there hasn't been, and I'm a good researcher as I am, uh, there hasn't been a single film, um, a documentary film, that came close to the Oscar on the subject, neither shortlisted nor nominated um, or winning. And even in this nomination, there were two anti-Nazi films, not a single Gulag one, because I suspect they consider it an internal Russian problem that this is not a world problem, this is our internal problem. Even though there are so many victims all over the world, there are survivors living everywhere, former republics, Latvia, Lithuania, Kazakhstan, you name it. Um, they wrote just in Cambodia, and anywhere where this um, took place. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, Party in, in, in Moscow that is completely legal and um, he's operating and also his daughter but I think most people uh, there are a lot of deniers of what's happening and it's actually not showing it's not shown on major Russian channels it's not like uh, this is a widely uh, presented information because Stalin was never deemed guilty, this was never an official, there was never any official trial, there was never a Nuremberg right tri trial, like trial, because we won the war, you know, like they say, and so there was nothing, they were never condemned. So, um, because of this, I think that those who are setting this policy from above are guilty of this, you know, and this is why I think this film is so relevant, and this is why it deserves so much um, attention, and lots so much attention. Yes. Yeah. I just want to question uh, the history of it, just kind of after it, and with it. Did the Gulag continue during the other, like Kusha and Kusha? Um, in some ways, it, it wound down, didn't completely disappear. There were uh, political uh, prisoners after that, but the scale was completely different. You know, I think it continued, and the legacy of it now really exactly went away because. I took part in this film about the Pussy Riot, you know, you, you say something against it wasn't really, uh, the girls didn't really uh, commit any crime except for singing in a, uh, in, a, in a church and the words for Mother of God, please chase Putin away. And this is why, you know, this punk, it was, you know, the film was called The Punk Prayer, Pussy Riot, The Punk, punk Prayer, this is why they, they were taken away um, 
uh, taken away for three years, you know, and this is to, to the camp, and we visited them in the camp, you know, in, in Mordovia. I thought I went and I participated because I thought maybe I'll take some shots from, shots from my film. I didn't because it was winter shows, different, um, different time, but the prison system didn't really change that much, except for, you know, there's not that much political prisons, there may be few in between that talked about widely in, in the world if that happens, but the larger legacy, nothing was ever stopped completely and restarted. It's just sometimes same location and occasionally, rarely, even the same methods. Rarely, but it does because it was never the death. It was never nobody. It was never criminalized like it should, it should have been. And when the women got out of the uh, women got back to and returned home, would they have been seen like sympathetically, or would people have treated them like as if they had committed great crimes against the state? Like what, like, what, what was the attitude? I'm sure that it was very hard for them uh, to adjust to, to, to the civilian life, you know, and I think I read books about it, I read articles about it, it's just, you know, it opens, this is a t this film is the tip of the iceberg, you know, I'm sure, because we know that there was rape there, that we know that there was violence there, that we know that there were diseases that, that were just completely horrible, and what they're talking, there's a scene, a scene, a scene, a scene in this, literally a short film and so their adjustment like with any prisoner who's coming back um, you know their children if, if the children were not taken away wouldn't want to necessarily accept them you know they remember their mother as a beauty you know they come back no teeth you know ugly looking you know with this after so much drama I think that there was a conflict with the children with the relatives those people had very hard time finding jobs and sometimes, uh, you know, it wasn't until 1953 that some of them received rehabilitation because remember that exile forever. Then there was a stamp in a passport that said forever. And then we cut it together with this, uh, you know, funeral of Stalin, like an er ironic, you know, that nothing is forever really. But um, in their minds it was forever. So I think they lived with the stigma for a long time. And it's maybe for another film, but uh, the thing is that we, you know, we captured some of the one last ones, you know. So the ones that are still alive, are maybe close to a hundred, you know. You can still find, but um, this first account is, is very rare. This is also why this is timely. Yeah. Has anyone tried to do any kind of an accounting of how many people were sent? I mean. With, with so much of the material destroyed, I mean, has anyone tried to amass an understanding of just how many people were sent to the gulags and how many people perished there? Oh, the numbers really vary, very, you know, and this is why I carefully did not put the numbers in, in the film because um, when I read an Anne an Applebaum's book, you know, Pulitzer winning book called Gulag that um, Anne Applebaum wrote, um, I think, you know, the number of executed was about three million in, in the times of a great, great ter terror. But the number that is often uh, quoted is, 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 is maybe 20 million, you know, that which is, um, that were affected loosely, you know, so it's, you can't, it, it varies so much. For example, these special settlements where peasants were sitting, so they take away everything from them, relocate them to, to somewhere, to an open field. They dig pits in the ground, they die, or so they can't run because it's open woods, you know. They don't even have to be guarded, there shouldn't be fences. They don't have any paperwork, documents, so they can't really go far. So is that considered, that so-called unknown gulag? Because um, even when I talked to Solzhenitsyn Foundation, to Levitskaya, she said, we're selling the book of Solzhenitsyn and the proceeds go to help those victims. They get a little bit pension from the government, but um, some of the, um, you know, so they help those victims. And they said, well, do you help the people like Fokla, Xenia? They said, uh, we can't because it's too much and it's not, a, we, we don't consider it gulag, but they should be. And the, and the relatives and the families, so between 3 and 20 of affected, you know, that's, um, that's a wide, you know, but, but I think there are, there are some numbers. It, I don't think it's possible to really assess. So that's what I think. Um. Um, coming back to Samir's question, did you speak with any of them about their sense of the historical memory or their response to seeing, well, maybe they don't see it, but to other people who, who still respect Stalin and feel uh, 
that way about the past. Do, do they have any response to that? It would be interesting to have at least one of the survivors to see the film and ask her about yeah. that because, um, of course, you know, they, 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 they were happy that Stalin died. You know, that, of course, they, they, they were all aware of what criminal he was, but um, uh, I think each of them, from what I noticed, each of them lives in a little bubble, you know. A lot of them did not get married, did not have children as a result of what... Because this, this is also about women's experiences. First of all, we took women because they live longer, you know, most men are complete, most men are gone. So women, because they have longer life expectancy. And because, another reason is because women have a different experience from men. Men, men are all about ideas. You know, they, you know, they did, I said that, they did this, and they're all about maybe practical um, details. You know, my camera was, like Solzhenitsyn is describing, and the size was this, you know, and then they had the desk, and then I had this, and then I did this. Women's experience is the difference. I felt that it was about, um, about the, their family, and about how they are affected uh, through the loss of their family. So it would be about loss of their mother, execution of the father, inability to have a child, what happened to the husband, uh, not being able to get married, or uh, mostly got married in a camp, for example, um, and the whole, um, you know, meeting the sister. Uh, so it's, it's all, you know, and I think the biggest torture is not about what was happening to them, but what was happening to their loved ones. And this is how, you know, this is why they're talking about this as a genocide because, you know, you, some of them are under these repressions just because they were someone's daughter, they were someone's wife, they were in the family, like um, this princess, Adila Basagli, she was in a family of high official who was executed and so all the women around were arrested and rounded up, so they did nothing. So um, I forgot what the initial question was, but um, it would be interesting to, um, to talk to them how they, how they perceive today's day. I think probably quite negative, but, but they, they um, live you know, either by themselves, uh, dedicating all their lives to, to the cause, like Levitsk, uh, to the cause of Solzhenitsyn's uh, continuing his legacy. Um, or taking care of you know the parents' empty graves that she so they live in these memories, uh, or trying to rehabilitate, bring back the names of the, the citizens, or they live together with the families like Vera Hecker. She has grandchildren and she all her sisters died, so she has this you know in the houses daily chores, um, not really being involved in in the outside polit politics because that's. Um, the system is not noticing them too much, they don't want to give back to the system. Um, maybe. Two more questions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it was really hard to find any material from that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering how you managed to find the knowledge that you used in the Russian State Archives Guard, you know, they have some uh, footage, and the footage was shot as a propaganda footage. You know, and it's basic. It still looks, you know, like people were suffering and quite, quite awful. But they don't look emaciated or anything. And these are propaganda clips that say we're re rehabilitating the enemies of the people. And so here they are arriving to their rehabilitation camps, and this, they're being fed. And here they are being, you know, transported. So it's just from these clips. They're very known. They're used and reused. Everybody knows them in Russia. And, uh, and probably abroad, so there there is really not much, but uh, and it was not very hard to find. But if you try to look for something specific, that is not possible to find. It's just in the memoirs and um, uh, recordings and drawings and letters. You know, there are some people who wrote books about correspondence. Correspondence were preserved, like letters to families and back with pictures. Yeah. That's the government. It's a Russian government ever apologize or issue some sort of statement. That's the thing. You know, they never actually apologize. So this is why this film was made. It's very strange and weird that a Russian woman living in, in, in America had to make the film and it wasn't really made officially on a on a on a huge government. You know, it was interesting because when you know the Academy recognized the film, um, and I have a lot I used to work for Russian television, so I but in my early twenties back then. And so I heard about the Russian, the 
the reaction of official uh, executives for Russian television who are trying to push some other films for this year's Oscars. I said, so how did they react? They said, they were surprised and stunned. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they were just stunned because they do so much to try to get in. But the, 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 the answer is, look at the real issue. Look at what needs to be talked, to, talked about and you would be there too. You know, but you don't, one of the reasons why it cannot be made there is because neither Putin nor his electorate is very interested in a wide audience to see this because what he's trying to push is the idea of an effective strong leader, of an effective manager, and so, which is what Stalin was. And so it's not in his interest <laughs> or it's, you know, to, to completely um, discredit uh, what Stalin did. And one interesting uh, point was that, you know, I actually asked a friend to buy a school book, a uh, history school book, to, to read what happened, you know, what are they teaching kids mm -hmm. today? Because in the 90s, the, when the truth started coming out, you know, the biggest thing that was done over the 70 years was by Khrushchev, uh, at first in the 60s, who, you know, it was called the Spring Thaw. Uh, when they turned around and, and said, well, Stalin made a lot of mistakes. And this was the first time in the 60s when this was mentioned. Stalin made mistakes and look at what was the people died, people were executed. And then the second person who did a lot for this was Gorbachev. During uh, uh, Perestroika and during Glasnost, so late 80s, you know, early 90s, when, when a breadth of information came out and, and we thought this is going to go up and lead to some sort of a trial or lead to some sort of and then Putin comes to power and he closes this down and very slowly um, he makes a statement that Stalin was ambiguous you know that this was you can't really say he was universally good or bad and in that book that I bought the first chapter was called industrialization success and um, the second one after that was talking about these repressions it was very condensed and then there was a questionnaire at the end that pretty much, if you sum this up, I have this in Russian, did you think Stalin was good, very good, or awesome? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, you know. <laughs> it was, you know, one, one was, it was in three paragraphs. So there was not even, in a discussion, there was not even um, a point to, to even say. Yeah. Did you then encounter any sort of obstacles in getting there to do this filming? Uh, the women. Mm -hmm. um, no, because, um, and, I, and I ask that a lot, I think that um, the only, the best way to cure the trauma, the trauma is, is to talk about it. So, um, it feels like what Adil was saying, and she was saying that, you know, I lived so long, I think I lived so long to tell the story. And, um, but she is one of the two people who wrote the memoirs about it. She wrote the memoir, uh, a book of memoirs, which is only well known in Abkhazia which is a region occupied by Russia now, but it's part of Georgia, you know, former republic. Um, so, um, and, and Fokla is another one who wrote memoirs. So two of them wrote memoirs, and the other three, they also wanted to talk. What interesting thing about this age, you know, when nearing the 80s and 90s, you start developing a bit of a, you know, Alzheimer's science, you know, things like that. So um, I think the way they, you know, some of them, um, like with Vera Hecker, the last days I remember, you know, because we filmed for several times, uh, the reaction would be fear, you know, but it would be, a, you know, a sign of dementia, you know. First time we interviewed her, she, she was fine, second, fine, but I think all of them are very prone to, to, to get into this fear that they would be persecuted or something would happen. Um, so, and I think that the, these signs develop because of what they lived. Because now nobody is, of course, threatening anything. They can talk freely. But 99.9% uh, .9 you want to talk about. And but one thing you know, with the, which I found interesting, is um, that they wouldn't want to talk about the most horrible thing that I would assume happened around them, which would be rape. Which you know I read about a lot, and I, and I knew that there would be violence and accounts of that, and I couldn't really get this out to them, you know, I knew that one of them married in the camp, uh, one of them mentioned that somebody else was uh, subjected to that, but not me, so the most, you know, the strongest was that gynecological exam, but it felt like they wouldn't 
want to talk about it and so and I didn't push them that much because um, I wanted them to talk about what they wanted to talk about mm -hmm. and and again you know as a practically short and medium-length film I thought it's good to show the tip of the iceberg and how people imagine 